Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Reza. Um, very nice to uh, to be talking with uh, actually just about everybody here that I already know. Uh, so that's a very nice surprise. I'm going to be talking tonight uh, tonight because it's night right here um, about uh, aligning open source governance with organizational business objectives. The idea is that if you're going to be doing open source, you're doing it to support your business objectives, and if you're going to put in place a governance model uh, for your open source usage and contributions and so on, then that must be also strictly aligned with the objectives so that it helps deliver these objectives. So um, I'll, I'll start by a, a brief introduction uh, because I, I have to <laughs> about myself and Wipro. So I'm Gilles Gravier. I'm based out of Geneva in Switzerland and um, I'm part of Wipro. We are a global system integrator. We actually a board member uh, of uh, FinOS uh, so we work quite a bit with uh, with James, uh, who's uh, actually sitting in the room, uh, or sitting or standing, no sitting. Um, with Pro, we have in-house, we have over 200,000 employees, but we have 20,000 open source developers. We're members of 25 foundations and communities. We have an internal community of over 5,000 people that exchange almost daily on, on open source uh, subjects. And, you know, just to give one, one little claim to... Uh, to being present there. We're the 128th global competitive uh, contributor to Kubernetes, for example. So we're a member of IGEA, which is a, uh, a tool that is a DevOps monitoring platform that was actually developed by a bank initially and then made open source. Uh, and then a few others. Um, we're part of OpenChain. We're actually an integration partner of OpenChain. So OpenChain helps create uh, assessments for uh, complying uh, to, uh, to uh, the best practices for um, for open source governance, for example. So, so that's that's Wipro and open source in a few words, and uh, and that's all I will be saying about Wipro. Let's talk a little bit about open source um, and uh, and open source in the uh, in the enterprise. So, <clears throat> when when companies do open source, if it's very common that they start looking at open source initially because uh, they want to save uh, money. People think that open source comes for free, so it reduces the cost when you use open source. And uh, this may be right. This is often a mistake if you're not doing open source correctly, uh, and typically because people tend to forget that it requires uh, a lot of uh, integration work to connect uh, best of breed components uh, to create an overall solution. It requires support, training. Um, if you're working with community versions, there's no SLAs for support with communities. So how do you manage all of that? That can actually turn into a costly nightmare. But if you do it well, you can end up indeed um, spending your money in a better way uh, with open source than proprietary commercial software. Now, that said, when we ask our clients, what is the biggest benefit for you um, for your organization when you do open source. And I use the term do open source because it includes use open source, but also contribute back to open source when you fix a bug uh, or even publish your own open source. So what is the what is the first benefit? Well, the first benefit is actually pace of innovation and quality of innovation. Um, primary innovation is when you innovate, you create innovative stuff. Secondary innovation is when you benefit from somebody else's innovation. And when you're using open source software, you're using software that has been developed by a community sprinkled around the planet with uh, uh, a lot of diversity, a lot of uh, you know, uh, regional diversity, cultural diversity, gender diversity, religious diversity, you name it. And so these people all bring to the, to the tools they're developing, to the project they're contributing to, Great ideas, ideas that a marketing team, a central marketing team, like in a commercial product, probably would never have had. And the nice thing <clears throat> is that all of the ideas actually correspond to user need because people aren't going to spend time writing and contributing code unless it's for something that they actually feel they have a need for. So the, the, the innovation that goes into open source is very user centric and, and benefits usually the community. That's quite impressive. And as a user of open source, this is very, very often listed as the main benefit. Another interesting benefit is the fail fast. Um, since procurement of open source is pretty straightforward, you download it, you run it, 
and then if you don't like it, you ditch it. Um, it's very easy to try new things. If they don't work, you know, you didn't go through a whole procurement process. You didn't purchase the software. You didn't have to sign agreements, NDAs or whatever. You just downloaded some stuff. It didn't work. You deleted and downloaded some other stuff. So when you're going to try to innovate uh, or develop, it's going to let you uh, be much more agile in exploring different directions. Um, and, uh, and that is important for your, uh, for your time to market. Another one is actually that term zero day productivity, which is a, a, a play on the, on the zero day vulnerability in the security space. But that term was coined by one of my uh, clients here in the UK, a bank. And uh, the, the person who heads their open source activities was saying to me, this is really cool. When we hire an open source developer uh, to work on, a, on an open source project to implement it, to uh, maintain it, or et cetera, if they're a contributor to that project, they don't need training. The moment they, joined, they join our team, they're productive. They're productive on day one. They're actually productive on day zero because they're already working on a product before. So, so this is great in terms of developer productivity. You, you hire people and they're instantly um, uh, productive. That's a, a really, really strong benefit. Um, it's also quite interesting to see companies. This one, I can name the company because it's public. But if you look at Société Générale, they have a, a manifesto for uh, open source. So we call it their strategy. It's in three points. Uh, their strategy is consume, contribute, and attract. So they use their open source activities to actually attract developers and actually, and I can't say how, because this is internal to them, but uh, they use their open source activities to, to uh, uh, retain, uh, yeah, to keep employees in-house. So they do employee uh, developer uh, recruitment and retention. And one of the ways they do that is every time they participate in an event, a conference, something like that, they have a booth, even if they have a speaker speaking somewhere, they have a booth where there are people presenting what they do and HR people. And there's another company that I've seen do that uh, at uh, All Things Open Conference in the US. It's Disney. Disney is the same thing. They participate in an event. They have one or two HR people on the event, at the booth, uh, collecting the resumes, explaining what they do, talking to people. Uh, because it, it, open source attracts the best developers. So if you're going to want to attract the best developers, you know, do open source and talk about it which is the next benefit. It's great to generate visibility around open source because since you are doing open source, it's visible outside. It's open, right? Anybody can see it. So there's no reason not to communicate about it. So companies find that it's super interesting and easy to communicate uh, using social networks, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, um, or even their GitHub site. You know, uh, when you look at Novartis, they have a lab called NIBR, which does uh, some fancy uh, DNA sequencing development, and they publish code on their GitHub. They actually have also a dedicated web page, and nobody contributes to this code. They're doing this for one single reason, show the world that they're the best at this stuff. And that's pretty cool. It doesn't cost them a lot. They're like a pretty static website and a GitHub page, which they get for free anyway, because GitHub is free for open source projects. So, you know, you can generate visibility uh, by properly uh, communicating around your open source activities. Now, all of these things, um, uh, you know, can have an impact. If you publish without controlling what you're publishing, there's a risk of somebody creating a tweet or posting code on GitHub that contains, like happened to a British bank a few, uh, a year or two ago, or three maybe, if Reza, if you remember, uh, uh, Scottish bank, I think, that had published some codes uh, on GitHub that included internal uh, application access passwords, which were not very dangerous from the outside, but still uh, pretty much, you know, didn't look that good uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, data filtering and, 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 and control. So you have to be careful. You have to put in place the right tools to make sure that what you're going to be doing in terms of open source activities in order to reap all of these benefits and more um, doesn't put your, um, your organization at risk. So, um, the next step is, you know, when you're going to be doing all of this fancy stuff, you are going to want to get um, the right kind of people involved. And very often when I talk to companies about open source, the first people in line are the IT people. And 
the IT people are people who look at open source as very often a way to reduce their costs, as I mentioned earlier, and that's not necessarily the wrong approach. They also have other interests in open source, obviously, you know, getting the right stuff running, uh, making sure it's, 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 it's optimized code, et cetera. And, and sometimes the open source stuff is just way better than the commercial stuff anyway. So, so they will look at functionality and performance, but very often the CIO looks at open source for cost, but there are other people. And those will uh, have an impact as well uh, when you're talking about governance. That's the risk people. The risk people, they're going to be looking at the open source activities from a compliance and risk uh, liability perspective, right? If I publish open source code and it includes proprietary uh, data, will I lose my patents or the rights to enforce them? Um, if I mistakenly publish a database with... Uh, user, you know, client or just internal user names and passwords or credentials or uh, private information in general. There's a GDPR risk uh, right around the corner. Um, if I use open source and I don't make sure that it's, uh, it's uh, properly patched and updated, uh, I have a security risk. If I, um, uh, if I use open source in my own code and I don't follow the licensing terms properly, I could, you know, have a serious issue, a serious legal issue. For example, if I'm using GPL code in an application that I'm developing, that application that I develop, in general, there are details, but in general, must also be made available under an open source license compatible with the GPL. If I forget that story, then I might have the risk of having to publish my source code and whatever else source code I added to my application that happened to a car vendor, BMW, not too long ago in 2015, where somebody figured out that it was running Linux. So they asked uh, BMW, I'd like to see the source code for everything in the car because the car is an embedded system. If there's Linux somewhere, everything else has to be GPL. It took some time, took some lawyers, and then BMW sent them a CD-ROM with the source code of everything that was in the car that was connected to the original GPL software. What did the person do? put the CD on GitHub, accessible for free. Since the GPL license lets them, the recipient of the code, redistribute the source code as well as the binaries in original or modified form to anybody. So BMW ended up with their source code all around the world with all their you know, interesting uh, tweaks and code. And it's not the only story that way, but that's the most recent one that I that I know of. Um, as I said, there's also a security risk. Uh, make sure you know that uh, you use source code analysis software to check for vulnerabilities and their remediation. Uh, GitHub will do that for you. There's software like Sneak or others that that will do that for you. But if you're using open source software, uh, whether you use it internally or you um, you integrate that in the software that you publish, make sure that. Every time there's a new vulnerability that appears for one of the pieces of software that you use or embed in your code, um, you fix it and publish a fix to your users, internal or external, because if you don't, they will find out about it as well, and they will go screaming either at you or at the press. Um, so it's not a good story for you if you don't fix these vulnerabilities. Um, interestingly enough, you should also think about you know publishing things like software bill of materials, um, yeah, my camera turned off. That is interesting. Um, so, uh, sorry about that. Uh, so, um, so think about, you know, uh, providing a software bill of material that includes all of the software components that are embedded into the, um, the software that you may be selling to customers. Legal, your legal team will want to look at open source from a licensing perspective. As I mentioned earlier, if you're using open source code, make sure you uh, adhere to uh, the licenses in the source uh, of that software. Some licenses, for example, include patent protection. They say that the software may be covered by patents, but as long as you use it following the licensing terms, you are not going to be sued according to those patents. If you don't follow the licensing terms, you will be sued. And that's in the license. And so, for example, if, if you're using GPL software and uh, you actually uh, forget to make your own open software open source uh, and the original software is covered by patents, you might be actually sued for those patents. I'm not, I don't remember if the GPL has a patent clause, but some, there are quite a few licenses that do have that. 
Um, so your innovation team, your head of innovation, your Skunk Works, if you have those, will lo look at open source in a way to drive, as I said earlier, more efficient innovation. So you will want to talk to these people, make sure they are part of your, um, your overall process. HR, uh, I hinted at that earlier. You, everything you do with open source that can have an impact on recruitment, and that might just be as simple as every time you communicate about open source. Or it could be when you when you create a job posting for a, for a job that's going to be pushed to LinkedIn, make sure if you want an open source developer um, that you list the projects that they will be contributing to because used internally and that uh, make sure that they're encouraged to actually contribute to the project when they find bugs. And of course, you know, uh, you can include in your uh, job posting that you're looking for actual contributor or even better committers. Um, so make sure that um, uh, that you have to be really, uh, yeah, that you involve your HR people. Um, so, um, Yes, uh, Jeremy, you're you're right. It, you said it's a fallacy that if you accidentally put code into a uh, into a GPL pro private code into a GPL program, you have to publish that code. You do. Sometimes it's not easy. So, for example, uh, when Linksys uh, did that and they were asked to give away all of their source code, um, they actually ended up doing it. By the way, they ended up publishing the the, the proprietary source code of. Uh, uh, Broadcom Wi-Fi drivers, which got pretty upset about this, so they ended up signing a licensing deal with them so that they could do that. And at some point, because the telecom regulation authorities realized that with the source code available, it was too easy to modify the uh, radio sections to transmit at higher band uh, at higher uh, transmission power, they told Linksys they couldn't sell these devices in countries like Europe anymore. So this is when Linksys decided to remove all of the open source code and move to another open source, uh, another operating system, not Linux anymore, but um, uh, VX, uh, VXWorks, I think, which is a microkernel. And, and then when they did this, all of their OEMs that used their hardware to create their own products like Fun Network started screaming at them because they didn't have access to the, the, the operating system anymore. So they actually had to recreate a, an actual GPL version uh, for which they published, again, all the source code. Now they actually have a website, uh, gpl.linksys.com, I, I think is, where they have all of the source code of all of the GPL devices, uh, uh, all of the devices that have GPL software inside. So you're right. I mean, you don't have to make all of your code public. But the thing is, what happens with the code that has already been published? It's out there, uh, and so you, it, it, it can be extremely complex to handle. And yes, if you remove the non-compliant code, you could get away with it. Culture and transformation. Um, when you're going to go to new models, when you're going to, uh, uh, when you're going to uh, encourage your own uh, developers to contribute code, you're going to need to train them. You're going to need to make a habit of contributing if you find bugs you know, uh, fix them and then push the code, do a pull request uh, and get those patches accepted. Not only does it make your your work more efficient because once you've patched a bug, if you have to maintain that patch internally, it's very costly. If you contribute it and it gets uh, accepted, then you don't have to maintain it anymore. The next version will include the patch and the software is automatically updated for you. Um, so that's that's pretty cool, actually, when you do that. And it generates visibility because, of course, your developers are going to be contributing as employees of your organization, right? So you want to encourage that, you want to encourage uh, posting uh, to social media. That might not be trivial. I joined a company uh, before being at Wipro. They had a strict policy to not ever use social media because they were afraid that customer data might leak one day. Uh, it took about a year to actually get them to accept creating a Twitter account and, and and even then, they still had only the uh, uh, the marketing people who could tweet uh, on the Twitter account. It took some time to actually let them have employees uh, use that. So it takes a lot of time, and you need to you know educate the, the culture and transformation team, and they'll have a lot of work to do. And finally, uh, your marketing and communications team will be there to leverage all open source activities for thought leadership, driving you know visibility, attracting talent, etc. So. So think about it. Open source isn't just an IT problem. It's, 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 a, it's a core element of a lot of your teams. And when you're going to be preparing your governance model, you want to include all of these in your, um, 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 in your, in your organization.
So let's look at governing. And I, because I'm conscious that I only have 30 minutes, this is going to be my last content slide. So I should be on time. Um, when you're going to look at governing your open source, again, I'm not here to explain how to do it. That's a long, long, long process that's got to be tied into your corporate uh, structure or, uh, uh, and models. But it's more of a, what do you have to take in mind? And if you need help, obviously, I'll be happy to help. Um, so first of all, you know, some key elements. You want to make sure you have a clearly defined strategy for doing your open source activity, right? Where do you want to go? What are the benefits you expect? Um, why are you doing this? Um, if you're not, if you don't have a strategy clearly defined and accepted, um, it becomes really hard to justify everything you do uh, around, well, open source, but anything else as well, right? On the other hand, if you have a line in your strategy that says we're going this way, well, if you do something that helps go this way, it's very easy to justify. It supports the strategy. So do that. Um, policy creation, you know. Um, Define the correct way, the correct ways, I should say, uh, to get where you want to go, right? So you're, you create policies um, that uh, that support your open source strategy, your risk model, your uh, your, your your legal uh, context, your uh, your your regulatory context, etc., to make sure that everything you do uh, follows a um, a policy that ensures it's going to be done the right way. And then you're going to create processes, of course, uh, that support uh, these uh, these policies where relevant. You um, you want to make sure that you have executive sponsorship, right? Because these are going to be significant changes, um, going from not using or not contributing to open source to actually doing that will generate different types of visibility, will uh, bring new types of code, new models for interacting with support, uh, probably change your procurement model, etc. So you want to make sure that your management agrees and supports your open source activities, and and basically, you know, show them what's in it for them. Um, once you define your strategy, that includes things like communicating, brand uh, brand awareness, thought leadership. The, the executive management will understand that, and they will support it because they will see the benefit. Okay. Um, I mentioned stakeholders in the previous slide. Make sure they're all aboard. Typically, when you create an open source uh, uh, model for your organization, which will be uh, uh, supported by the proper governance uh, model, your open source activities are driven by something called an open source program office, which has a few people that are dedicated to open source and stakeholders from the various teams I mentioned in the slide before. Because the OSPO, the open source program office, will create a governance model involving all of these people help. They will help actually define the governance model. They will tell you, we need to look into that. We need to keep this into account. We need to make sure that doesn't get dropped out, et cetera. Um, one of the important aspects of your governance is your inventory. You need to know what's in your environment. So before you do anything around open source, you probably want to scan all of your software and figure out how many open source and which open source components you are already using. Because most likely you are, whether it's because you picked them somewhere or because you're using commercial software that includes open source components. Most of them do. Actually, 96% of all commercial software includes open source uh, to some, some uh, extent or another. Um, that's a 2019 or 20 statistic from... Um, from um, ah, uh, I don't remember the, the name of the organization. Anyway, uh, so so that's uh, that's significant, and that in inventory can be made easy if the software you have has software bill of materials. If not, you might have to have tools that scan that. Um, I remember talking to a customer at the beginning of a project where we asked them, you know, how many open source components do you run internally? Ah, probably three hundred. Well, we found 6,000. So um, make sure you know as much as possible, as clearly as possible, as precisely as possible, all of the open source components you use, because when you're going to want to govern the use of that, you want to make sure that everything, that you don't leave anything, you know, uh, aside. Um, your, your provisioning structure is going to be a part of your, your, your governance model. How do you get new open source software in-house? whether it is purely community downloadable by anybody, 
or you have to actually purchase some kind of support or subscription like Red Hat, um, you have to figure it out. You have to make it clear. Ideally, you don't really want anybody just downloading stuff from the internet because they might download it from the wrong place. They might not be getting the latest version. So create a model where it's safe to actually use open source by creating the right kind of provisioning uh, uh, model and structure. Maybe have a repository of open source components that people can use. And if somebody wants to use something that's not in the repository, have a process to first validate that it can be put in the repository, then put it there. And then everybody, when they want to use the software, they'll find it validated inside an internal repository. When you do this, make sure it's reactive because when there's a security bug, patches come out really quick and you wanna make sure that they're available in your repository just as fast, okay? Then finally, uh, audit everything you need. You want to keep track of everything. If something goes wrong, if you want to justify, uh, if you want to explain uh, at some point, if somebody asks you if there's you know, uh, some kind of external audit, having a trace of everything you do um, is critical. And that auditing will actually also help you uh, create the kind of reporting that your uh, executive management will want uh, in order to verify, you know, that the objective were achieved, including in terms of corporate branding, in terms of, you know, revenue, if you're selling the stuff, in terms of, I don't know, uh, uh, workforce augmentation, if you're recruiting using your open source activity and so on. So those are, you know, there's eight different elements that you want to take into account. I'm sure you can add a few more, uh, but those are the ones that I think are the most important uh, in your uh, in in defining your uh, your governance uh, model for your open source activities, whether it's using, contributing, or publishing. So um, this is really the end. But you know, if you're going to want to do this. Um, make sure you start by assessing where you are today. You know, you can't set a strategy if you don't know where you are. In order to define where you want to go, you have to know where you start from. Formulate your objectives and the corresponding KPIs. Um, and then, you know, start planning uh, the actual strategy. Uh, and and when, when you're looking at strategy, remember, we're looking three to five years, right? It's not an implementation plan that can come afterwards. When you have the strategy in place, start looking at implementation. But your strategy ideally should, you know, fit in two pages and shouldn't have too much detail, but more of a, where do I want to be in three to five years? So that's what I wanted to say in this uh, short 30-minute uh, session. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, I think we already got um, a question from Jeremy, but let's just first hear from, uh, is it okay if you come um, at the front because um, the microphone will not pick up your question. Thank you. We've got a question here, um, Jill. Okay. Uh, sir, I have been in computers for something like 40 or 50 years. Uh, most of it, my experience has been on mainframe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the PC side of it is uh, quite small comparatively. Uh, my question is, uh, what is open source and why open? What is open source? So open source is a term that was coined in, in the early 1990s. It's a follow-up on what was initially called free software by the uh, Richard Stallman, who basically coined the term. Uh, free software referred to freedom, freedom to... Uh, study, tinker, redistribute, and use in any way you want. Those are the four freedoms that uh, that uh, Stalin created uh, and invented for free software. But when the business world started using free software, they needed a definition that felt more aligned with business requirement. And they coined the term open source by giving a definition in 10 points that includes more or less the freedoms uh, to freedom to access the source code, freedom to modify the source code, freedom to redistribute the source code, um, guarantee of um, uh, um, uh, attribution. If I wrote the code, my copyright should stay in there. Um, no restriction on a field of endeavor, no restriction on technology, uh, no restriction on people or groups to use. So basically a bunch of, uh, of more precise more business-oriented uh, um, definition points that define what an open source license, which is what governs the use of an open source software, looks like. So open source software is software that you're free to copy, 
study, redistribute, modify in original or redistributed form, provided you satisfy the obligations that come with it, i.e., for example, if you're, uh, if you're embedding your open source into another software, that other software might need to be made open source or not, depending on the license. Uh, if you modify the open source software you use before redistributing it, you might have to make these modifications open source or not, depending on the license and so on. Is it uh, restricted to certain languages like nope. Java or C++? Nope. nope. No restrictions on anything. You cannot restrict field of endeavors, technologies, etc. So no, all uh, there's no restriction to any language. There's no restriction on hardware, field of endeavors. It's not even restricted to software. There are open source houses. There's open source colas, open source beers, open source cars. You name it. Um, as long as there's a blueprint for something uh, that somebody can take and, and modify and make that something again, that can be open sourced. Right. Thank you. Yep. Great. Um, Jeremy, do you want to ask your question? Okay. Because I, 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 we can't see. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. It sorry. took me a while to find the unmute button. I, I, no, Achilles, I think, answered it very comprehensively. And I think his last sentence, it's a complex problem. Um, but <clears throat> I, I think it is important to understand there's, there's a bit of a myth that, oh my God, I've got a piece of code that shouldn't be in there. I can do nothing about it. You can do things about it. It doesn't have to be that you have to. I mean, I'd always say there's a benefit of open sourcing code and various companies have accidentally done that and then found it's been beneficial. Um, but it, it's important, I think, to say that it's not the only solution available. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Jill, thank you very much. Uh, I know it's quite late for you, um, and uh, great to have you having you here.